Jim McIntosh's layout is a winner in many ways. Jim's layout was featured on the cover of the June-July 2013 issue of Old Gage Railroading Magazine, and a feature article in that magazine introduced you to his layout. Jim's evolution in the model railroading hobby sounds familiar. Did the trains for you know a number of years, and and then you get married and go dating and all that, and kind of get out of it for a while. I came back in, I guess, in the late 60s. I went to HO, like everybody else does. I think that's in our age group. And uh, didn't really think too much about O-Gage because I liked the detail in HO. That was the, I'm a detail person, obviously, you can tell. And uh, I just didn't like O-Gage because it wasn't detailed enough for me. And then I guess it was in the 90s sometime when MTH came out and I started seeing some of the stuff they were putting on the features and everything, and it blew me away. And I thought, this, this is what I got to try. And so that's what I did. <laughs> I got that, and one thing led to another. And I'll tell you what you see here right now. What we can see here right now is a marvelous O-Gage layout with floor-to-ceiling scenery and some of the nicest backdrops we've ever seen on a model railroad. And even though the scenery certainly looks like eastern mountains, Jim didn't attempt to model anything specific. In fact, when I asked him if he had an overall modeling philosophy for the railroad, Jim had a great answer. <laughs> it really isn't one. Uh, I just kind of put in things that I like that's not necessarily any part of the country. Uh, I, like, I like different levels. And uh, I think that that's, that's the one thing I never had before. I had sheets of plywood in the past and it was all flat and everything. I said, that's not what I want. I want to have things that you know, up and down trestles and bridges and things like that. That's what I wanted to see and what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, like I say, as far as modeling anything specific, it's not really. I have all the road names in here. I buy things because I like them, not necessarily for any other reason. One thing that catches your eye as soon as you enter the layout room is the bridges. There are several of them, and they are massive. Uh, some of them are kits, some of them are atlas, and uh, I guess they were all kits to some degree, some more so than others. And some of the bridges I made myself, they are scratch belt now that you mention that. They, I, I just used uh, masonite and pieces of balsa wood and glued them all together, and it's got a, a, a base of like a one by four, and you just kind of model it up from there and I uh, enjoy doing it. I'm not as good as a lot of people, but I enjoy doing some of that stuff. Jim used Atlas track and both Atlas and Ross custom switches for his track work. The track is all ballasted to look very realistic, as does all the scenery on the layout. Jim also has a Ross transfer table and turntable. Uh, it was one of the first transfer tables that Ross made. Uh, if, actually, it was the first, because Steve called and told me that it was, a, it was the first one. And I love it. I mean, his stuff is out of sight. I mean, it just it operates perfectly. Uh, you know, I've also got the turntable, and, the, and I've had other models that didn't work. They, you know, they were terrible. And uh, I said, I'm not going to get anything else until I get something that's really, that really operates well, because I like to operate everything. And uh, this stuff is really, uh, it's really done the job. I'm really happy with it. Like the layout itself, the electrical side of things is also a robust design. Uh, I've got uh, five Z4000s that are underneath the layout. Four of them run the trains and, uh, and one of them is just for accessories. And I got no numerous other smaller accessories. Uh, transformers all around, powering lights and things like that. But uh, and as far as the control system on the trains, I got TMCC, and Legacy, and DCS, and uh, everything works well together. I mean, I like both systems really well. I think that you need both companies to keep things competitive.
Jim did much of the work of building this layout himself. But a railroad this big and this well done doesn't typically get built overnight or by just one person. I'm a pretty good carpenter. I can build all the bench work and I, and I laid all the track and wiring. I'm very good at that. And I, you know, I got to that point where I was slowing, slowing way down mainly because I wasn't quite sure what to do next. And uh, so I called Brian at, at uh, Legacy Station, the train shop that I deal with. And I told him, I said, I've got to a point where I, I need to do scenery and I want you know things to look realistic, weathering and all that. And I really don't know that I can do it the way I want it done. And uh, he said, well, I think I got somebody for you. So uh, he introduced me to Richard Ruggles. And uh, Richard came in here and uh, we got to be very good friends. And he started coming every other Wednesday for the next four or five years. As Jim said, most of this magnificent scenery is the work of a very talented guy, Richard Ruggles. My role was to help him do the landscaping and, uh, and the trees and the foliage. I built all that, the trees and stuff, uh, and uh, just give him a hand on anything landscaping-wise, you know. I use pastel chalks, and then uh, I, I've learned how to airbrush on top of that. Uh, and, and it's a... It's a three or four step way of doing it. You know, you just can't do it all at once. It has to be done in steps, you know, in order to get that realistic look. The more realistic you make it, the better it looks to me. In the construction, you use cardboard, uh, hot glue guns, uh, and then plaster cloth. Like I said, as far as the manufacturers, the only thing I can tell you is the Scenic Express was a big manu manufacturer that I used. Pretty much everything else I built myself. The trees and the foliage that you see out here it was built by me. I didn't buy it. Once you get the hard shell down, then, then you know, it's just painting, you know, just latex paint. Uh, if, if you put on your darkest colors in the back very first, you know, and, and work your way out, that creates the shadows and then you highlight and dry brush on the outside of it. You know, like I said, there's no, no rhyme or reason to it. You know, you just do it what feels good, you know, and, and it'll come out eventually. It'll, it'll come to the forefront. But there's not, not anything to be intimidated about. That's what I'm trying to say is, it, to me, it was just the best stress reliever, reliever for me is uh, just to get out some newspapers and, and some plaster and uh, could use drywall. There's a lot of different compounds that you can use. You can mix this stuff up in a bucket you know, and just put it on with a paintbrush, you know, and just don't be intimidated by it. That's, that's the main thing. Think about road trips that you took with your family and, and think of the landscape as you saw it going down the highway. That's what I do. I just kind of think of things naturally or I'll walk outside and look over the hills and it'll come to you, you know, what it should look like. The other aspect of Jim's layout that is just stunning is the backdrop painting in the sky. For that work, Jim turned to another very talented young lady, Elaine Oy. I, I really tried to bring uh, Richard Ruggles' work further, like past where it ended. Instead of it stopping at the wall, I really wanted the scenery to look like it kept going forever and ever. And I uh, also wanted it to feel bigger. So I, uh, I think I just extended the 3D work onto a flat surface. Uh, I think that it's uh, a pretty particular and specific hobby that I can enjoy every day, all day, and, and I'm interested in it like to no end. So I would love to, to bring life to the walls that contain these, these layouts. I can't imagine life without having such a, a hobby and a passion. It's, it's something that I think about, like I wake up thinking about and I go to bed thinking about and absolutely love thinking about. And like Richard said, it, it really is a stress reliever. While there seems to be a common stress relieving theme in place here, when Jim starts running trains, things get exciting fast. <laughs>
When it's all said and done, Jim's enjoyment of the hobby spans a very wide range, and he's a big fan of the newest technology. I love these new features that are in the, in the new trains, you know, the, the smoking whistles and the bells that swing, and the, I, I just like it. And uh, people ask me, what's, what's the engine you like the best? And I said, the newest one I got, because it has more stuff on it. And I just, I think it's that thing that you have to keep going to a different level to get the same excitement you used to have years ago over something simple. Now, you know, and I, I want things that have all that stuff in it. That's what I like. I like the blow down smoke and the, you know, the, the things that are just different. You know, it's not the same, the same thing as it used to be. And, uh, and I, I hope they keep making this stuff and, and, and keep going, you know, a level beyond where they are now. Because I think it's fantastic. I just, and that's what keeps my interest.